And we're live. Yet? We're live. What? And we're live. And we're live. And we're live. And we're live. Oh. You got the wrong one. Why? One of them has the mic. That this one? one? Oh, I think great. That one has I'll the put mic. this one in. Guess what, guys? I have a mic now. All right. It even says you're live. Hey, guys. We're live. We're live. Um. Let's do a couple things. Shout out to Eric Berker. Always a shout out to Eric <laughs> Berker. Hey, Eric, can you hear Ange and I? We're, we're trying a little bit of different technology today. So just shoot us a note we have, we and let us know. We think we both have microphones, but we want to know for sure. Let us know what you guys think. Let yeah, just know. give us a shout out. That's what it's really fun to see. I know. I don't want people to miss my, my on point singing. So, um... Yeah, just give a shout out. If anybody can hear us. Can you guys hear us? We just want to make sure you guys can hear us. I'm seeing lots of hellos, but not... Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Maybe not. Oh, loud and clear. Loud and clear. No. Oh, awesome, Eric. Thank you. Great. Perfect. We are, we are drawn. On. Yeah, turn the music down now because oh, I, yeah. I suspect it can hear us super well. Ange, how are you? We fi- It only took a year, almost a year, and we finally figured out how to do it. You know, I would go back and listen to these episodes, and you sound like you're in a cave, like behind the house, ha- in a shed behind the house. Let's, oh, you know what? It's okay. It took a year, but we finally... We finally did it. We are finally in the 21st century. <laughs> took, took a while. Um, this is Drawn to Fantasy. Hello, uh, Maria in Bulgaria. What? Good morning, Peter in Alaska. What? Today is January 23rd. Is it today 23rd, Ange? I don't even know. Is it? Slurs Day. We're still in that. It is the 23rd today. 2021. What? Even just seeing somebody write 2021 is so weird. We are living in the future. We, today is a very... Uh, special episode for me. I'm super excited about it. You know, we'd have these where we would kind of go along and we'd, we'd kind of putter along and do our thing. And then every once in a while, we, I felt like, oh, I've got an idea for an episode and we get really excited. So I'm super, super excited you guys are all here today. What a week. Holy cannoli. A couple weeks. It's been a couple weeks since we've done this. And, Hello, uh, Tanya and France. I mean, I love that everyone is here gathering. Like, this, this international gathering of artists yeah. and art lovers. We're yeah. coming together. Because that is the theme this week. Is yes. unity. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, what I wanted to do, totally, to be honest with you, Ange, was, you know what everyone's... What, you remember way back when, 900 years ago, when people were allowed to co-mingle and hug each other, and you could have as many people as you wanted in your house? Um, like right now, we could... Like there's 80 people, 84 people watching. We could jam we them could all in here. We could all hanging out in our house right we now. Could all be, we could all be in the studio just hanging out. Hello in Germany. And, and I would love that. Yes. Um, I love, in the past, we've had, you know, occasionally, um, they teach an illustration master class up in uh, Amherst College in the summer, and every once in a while we'd have a few of the artists come over and hang out. You'd cook an amazing dinner. Yes, I usually make my uh, spaghetti and meatballs. That's right. And we would, um, one of my favorite memories is, you know, after a glass or two of wine and lots of food and catching up, we art out. Yes. We full-on art out so hard. What do I mean by arting out? I mean, like, I have flat files filled with original art, printed art, old ads, weird old books, and we huddle around these old pieces of art and we talk about it, and you always get this amazing insight. And I have such fond memories of arting out with so many artists that I admire, um, Barbara McClintock, talking about pen and ink with her. I remember Jerry Pinckney uh, coming here after an event, and he and I were talking about Heinrich Klei, who I would have never have thought he was inspired by, uh, showing... Laywin Pham, Sophie Blackall. Yeah, Lauren Long. I mean, we've had, we've had a lot of amazing artists here in the studio. And so what I wanted to do today was do a special edition of uh, Drawn to Fantasy where we're actually going to look at 
pen and ink art and kind of talk about it. Now, the, there's nine zillion amazing pen and ink artists out there. The pen and ink artists uh, I'm going to focus on today were just a few of the pen and ink artists that had an impact on me. So what we're going to do, we're going to do things like this. Hold on. I've got to pull my ear, earbuds off. You can talk, Andrew. You can maybe take okay, a question. Sounds do good. I Hi, Karen, get my John act together? in Ireland. John Denver in Maine. John Denver. John Denver and the Muppets. He's he's here. <laughs> I'm gonna start oh, with. I love Rocky Mountain High. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Somebody played the other day "Country Roads." Nice. That was my favorite song as a kid by John Denver. Of course, not the same John Denver that's watching right now. I assume, but. But, so look. I, I'm going to periodically hop around and hop on and hop off as I grab things. Everything's on the flat file. I'm just going to show an example of some of the stuff that inspired me. This, is, this one's an old, tired thing that we've talked about many, many times. This is the old Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Emily C. Martin said, will this be on YouTube? Yes. Yes. Well, Tony will be uploading this. Uh, every episode has been archived on YouTube. Um, the old Monster Manual from 1977. Huge impact on me. Uh, this was absolutely one of my... Favorite illustrations by David Trampier. David Trampier, he illustrated this. My guess is either in 77 or 1976, right before the book came out. And what we have, and what this is kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at today. This is a printout, Ange, at actual size of the original by David Trampier. So what this is going to do is allow us to look at this stuff, and I'm hopefully on your screen at home, a much higher resolution than we see in a book. And we can see things like, I can see crusted whiteout where he's corrected. We're looking at the, uh, the printout at actual size. There's a big glob of whiteout right there. And we can even see some notes. There's some notes here where we labeled it. This 55% is probably uh, how it was reduced. So the idea is to show what, pen and ink art I grew up with that I loved, but also let, let, you know, you guys have seen loads of my artwork in the raw. Let's look at some of the other artists and look at it in the raw, what it looked like when it came off the artist's desk. At actual size. Right? At actual size. So here's the big thing with all this stuff. It's all printed out and I printed it so I don't have to worry about gloves or anything. I mean, I don't, we don't own any, really any of the originals I'm about to show you today. Um, this one we do actually on the original, but it's on loan for an exhibit, so I, I printed it out. But we're going to look at really super high-resolution printouts that I tracked down through museums, through auction houses, through uh, universities, like the University of Connecticut, who loaned us some amazing pieces to uh, share with you today. And we're just going to talk. I'm going to show you guys this art. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and then we'll just take questions, and we'll just kind of go until you guys are bored. Um, there's a couple things I want to mention before we get started. I'll talk a little bit about um, Medium, and I've got some paper here to show you a little bit of how they worked. Also, we're going to talk, um, I'm going to use this term a lot, the percentage. So if you're not familiar with this at home, 100%, we notice here on Dave Trampier's piece, he has the word, he has the number 55%. So that's roughly half. If we line these two pieces up, Ange, and you look at them, you can see it's just a little, little over. It's basically it's fifty per, by fifty percent. Okay. So it was reduced to fifty-five percent. If we wanted to pr print it twice this size, so almost to fill this entire sheet of paper, we would have printed it at two hundred percent. So we're going to talk a lot about that because that's going to come into play a lot when we look at some of this artwork today. So I want to show you a couple from my um, my childhood when I was really starting to draw a lot. This Dave Trampier piece um, is just great. There's a lot that gets lost. This is an early print of the Monster Manual, and there's quite a bit of detail in there, but you can see just a little bit gets lost. So it's really interesting. So um, there's one example. I got another one from childhood, Ange, that I, that I remember seeing and being quite fond of as well. This is by um, the fabulous uh, Frank Frazetta. Yeah. Frank Frazetta was another big fantasy illustrator of the 70s. Probably many people know him. I uh, love his John Carter of Mars stuff. This, uh, this one here is a uh, frontis. That means it appeared in the front of the book, kind of to introduce the book from the gods of Mars and warlords of Mars with a Frank Frazetta painting on the cover. Uh, this is part of all the John Carter of Mars series. 
the first book being The Princess of Mars. This book came out in, I believe, 1974. I've got some dates on the back of this stuff to help me with some some notes. It came out in 1971, excuse me. Yes, he is the master, Eric Burkert. And I think one thing to say about Frazetta also is how many artists are influenced by him. Absolutely. And then also, like, you're watching movies and you're seeing production art and you see the scenes that you're like, oh, that's straight up Frazetta. Yes, yes. Um, absolutely. He's influenced so many artists. I was a, a fan right around the times I, I was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons and was reading these books. Uh, what's amazing is, you know, this is 1971. The printing quality is so, so I don't have first editions of a lot of these, but I have early editions. So these probably aren't too far off from what you would have bought in a store if you had bought it in 1971. And then if you look at the detail on here, you see, you know, Fraz is letting the, the ink run. He's, you're seeing this graying that's happening in the ink line. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this, this is a, a real master. He understands he's putting in these just big, thick, brick black shadows and um and then kind of building around it what's going on here Ange? if you look like on the knuckle and some of these parts the dip pen that he's using and i've got one right here and i suspect he was using a larger than normal this one's going to be a little wet i just pulled it out of the um the bin it was probably a pen not unlike this that you would dip in the ink so to, these pens are, are such a pain sometimes, Angie. They can really um, clog up with the ink. So you, you're constantly dipping them in water to help pull the ink out. And what happens is as you're, as you're inking, the water to ink ratio builds up. So you have more water than you have ink. And that's what he's actually using it here. So he almost has this gray that he's inking with, which is just cool. But the, it's just a real, it's almost like a doodle. Such an understanding of structure. So um, some more information on this. This one looks like it's roughly about 11 by 14. It's a pretty good sized sheet of paper. I have a question. Would he have been using the same pen, like the same dip pen for all of that? Because I know that you can get different kind of weights of the line in the way that you use the nib. I suspect there's brush. This looks like brush, Ange. I'm thinking he might have ske he, he might have sketched in the shapes first. Then went in, he might have gone in with the brush and then blocked in the where he thought the blacks would go with a brush yeah this is definitely brush and then he went back in fact this these these swoops here are definitely brush this is not pen you can see the switch where it goes from brush to pen so he might have built it up he either went one way or the other he either built up all these um dark shadows first with brush and then started inking around it or he inked it all and then brushed in the the thick shadow for sure he sketched this thing fully he understood exactly what he was going to draw before he drew it there's no way he picked up a pen and started going what's interesting here is um i'm seeing some rub out right here so he's definitely right he doesn't use white out it almost looks like he's using almost like an eraser he might have used an electric eraser which is almost dremel like so imagine like a little drill with an eraser on the end Ange, and you can you can kind of whoop, whoop, whoop. it's something a draft most you would have used in a drafting uh occupation like a like a an architect but I, I almost guess that's what he's doing right here uh some more fun facts on these uh he was 43 years old i always wondered how old people were it helps me envision them so he was 43 when he did this one in 1971 this one really shows the ink wash a lot more this is a little later this is 1974 this one is for the sword swords of mars so he was 46 years old when he did this one and this also combines a lot of wash. So here, Ange, I'm guessing, judging by the lack of ink ink lines going on in this arm, he he's he's putting the wash in first. I think he probably sketched it, did some tones with with ink wash, which is where you just take the ink, the India ink, and you dilute it with water, and then he's brushing it in, and now he's going back in with a fine crow quill here, and he's. Why he didn't do it here, I don't know. He certainly did it here. He used that cross hatching. He's using cross hatching there to thin it out a little bit. Um, I don't have the, the, the book of this, so I'm not quite sure how it reproduced, but I'm going to guess that all of this just turned into black mud mm -hmm. and his butt. All this probably just turned into solid, solid darks. But it's so darn delicate when you look at it up close. And it's just this beautiful contour, a little bit of residue from the tape where this was 
Emily C. Martin said she just wants to say we really appreciate all the effort you put into collecting these. It's like a curated online exhibit highlighting everything I would love to see. And it actually, you know, it's funny thinking about that. It's kind of cool because, you know, it's maybe a little more challenging to get into museums these days. So yes. You can't get close up to art. Um, like we normally would if we were going and traveling to museums and checking out original illustrations and paintings in person. So yeah, it is cool. So uh, yeah, Emily. all that. Yeah, I, I, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, I wanted it to feel like you're, you're in a space, an art space to kind of disappear from the, you know, the reality of the world for a little while today. I'm going to jump. One of the people I think probably, I know Frazetta was influenced by an artist named Roy Crinkle. Who was big influence on all these comic guys? Not as big of an influence on me, although grandfathered in through my love of Frazetta. The other person I suspect he was influenced by was this man. Uh, I spoke about him a little earlier, Heinrich Klei. Heinrich Klei, spelled like clay, and for many years I called him Heinrich Klei, um, but Klei would be how we pronounce his name. Heinrich did um, he did do some books. He was a German illustrator at the turn of the century. Um, he did a lot of magazines. Now, a lot of this stuff, when we go back in time, magazines have a huge, um, they're basically the internet for, for, you know, that late 1800s. And so a lot of the artists we're going to look at today got their start in, in magazine work. Cly is, is a real genius. This person had such an impact on me during my Planescape years. And the reason why is this just sketchiness. I think... Cly, um, I don't have a sketch here handy, but what he would do is he would he would just pencil in. He would figure it out. There's a little bit of pencil work there. We can see a little bit of pencil, um, but he would pencil in the shapes, a little bit of where the shadows were going to go, and then he just went to town and he did a lot of problem solving with the pen, and um, and it's just beautiful. He contributed a lot. Um, he had a he, well. First of all. Let's stop for a second. He had a full understanding of life drawing and anatomy, and so much so that he can bend it and twist it, especially horses. Horses are a huge part of um, his um, his ouvoir, and mm -hmm. if I said that right. Oh. In fact, Matthew Davies just said his animals are unparalleled, unparall and I couldn't agree more. Um, he contributed to a magazine called Ugent, which means youth in German. And it was basically an Art Nouveau magazine that was super trendy. And a lot of these illustrations are from Ugent magazine. So this is one here. This one is called Mode of Transportation, Antique Tramway. He was 48 <laughs> years old. This was done in 1911. Just an unbelievable I just piece. love how spontaneous it feels. It feels so spontaneous. Here's another unbelievable piece, a Bacchanalian kind of procession of animals. He did a lot of things with animals. Walt Disney um, was a huge fan of Cly's work and um, used many of his images to inspire Fantasia. The dancing alligators and elephants and ostriches all come from Heinrich Cly and his work. Um, I know someone had posted this on the um, Drawn to Fantasy fan page, but it was something I'm aware of. The, uh, the bookseller Stuart Ng actually acquired one of Cly's entire sketchbooks. It, and it's huge. The paper is really, I mean, you can see these are. This is 100%. This, this is, is at 100%. This is the size, the size it was at. Yep. Painting. So they're, they're big. I want to say they're almost bigger than 11 by 14. They've got a, they've definitely got a size to them. Um, and he's going to reprint this, a facsimile of that sketchbook. He's going to do it via Kickstarter, I so believe. So was he drawing this in pen and ink and then adding the color afterwards? Yes, yes. Like, because the ink is permanent ink that he's using, Ange, once it was dry, he could then lay in a nice light tone of watercolor. Um, I'm not educated enough on exactly all the printing processes through the decades. I have a very cursory knowledge of how it worked. So I'm not quite sure how this would have been reproduced. A lot of times these illustrators would do their original drawing in black and white and it would be printed in the magazine. And then later, if it was to be sold, often they would put a little extra color on it to sell it for it a couple. For black and white, yeah. usually for reproduction. Sell it for a couple extra bucks now if you put a little watercolor on it. I love, I love the, uh, the washes. It actually reminds me a little bit of Peter DeSev. Uh, I, Peter Desev is is absolutely influenced um, by Cly and has has uh, a couple originals of his own, some spectacular ones. So big influence on Disney, big influence on me, especially during the Planescape period. Here's what I like. What I think 
he's doing that's different than um, Frazetta. Well, similar but different. This donkey is definitely done in a heavy pen. He is just... It's this. This is the sound you would hear while he's working, by the way, as he's going along, all right? Then, to create atmosphere and depth, where this guy playing the, the horn is further back, he's going to switch nibs to a much smaller nib. This is a Hunts 102. This is kind of the one I swear by. And he's now working in a much finer line. And he's going to work it back there to create that sense of depth. So he's using heavy, heavy darks here, heavy hatching, to bring this donkey into the foreground and focus our eyes on it, right? It's the one silhouette we see here. It's just a jumble of silhouettes, so it's hard for our eyes to focus. But we can focus our eyes on this guy real easy. And then from there, our eyes kind of wander to, you know, Dionysus and everybody else who's having a, a good old time here. Matthew Robert Davies said Mark Davis also definitely inspired by him as well. And yeah. you can see that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. David House says, Deceb's another master. Absolutely. You know, uh, David, one of the problems I had as I was putting this together for you guys today was, where do I stop? Because I, I maybe we'll do a part two of modern people. These are all uh, dead people today. <laughs> <laughs> and and I should say dead white people. I mean, it's this, this the, the books I grew up and the art I grew up looking at when I was a kid growing up in the 70s, most of those were illustrated by men and white men. I'm so happy to see that that's changing. We do have uh, some female illustrators we're going to look at today, but they're few and far between from way back when, which is, you know, I'm really refreshed to see is changing. So maybe we'll do a modern uh, version of some of the artists that I love um, today that are currently doing just as amazing work. There's, there's no question. Barbara McClintock could, can do this. She does it all day long in her picture books. I'm going to um, move along. Do you have any tips for people who are new to inks? Yes, get messy, get dirty. It, you're going to mess up. Uh, we're going to see a lot of different sizes that these artists worked at today. We're going to see a lot of whiteout and correction. Um, and I've got a little bit of process stuff. So I think it's the only way you learn this and learn how to master it is doing and doing and doing and doing and doing it over. I have always likened a, an, an amazing masterpiece of pen and ink like this is just as beautiful and mind-blowing as a painting because the problem solving is so difficult here where you're just going what do i ink and what do i leave alone and it's reflective in the collection and the post-market values uh some of these i wrote what they sold for at auction as i was pulling them off of sotheby's and christie's i'll see if i can if i find some with prices on them i'll note them um another bef really before arthur rackham has a huge impact on me this man does Ange. this is henry justice ford a.k.a. H.J. Ford, not to be confused with the car maker, the automobile mastermind. This is a different mastermind. And my mom had purchased a... Um, oh, there goes Rosetta. My mom had purchased a series of books with, that we had as kids growing up called the uh, Rainbow Fairy Books by a man named Andrew Lang, Scottish author, who kind of collected all these old fairy tales. We didn't have these fancy old-timey copies. We had just little crummy paperbacks. But I loved these books. These, these fairy books were hugely influential on me as a young uh, kid and as a young artist. These were actually very influential on the Spiderwick books. They're lavishly illustrated. There were loads of them. I want to say he did 10 or 12 of them, Ange. And the we're gonna be we are in 1901 for this one. So these are these are quite old. They're all in public domain. Um, the pen and ink work is spectacular, and there is loads of it. Just unbelievable amounts of it. Um, H. J. Ford was just an a powerhouse artist, um, and if there are Dungeons and Dragons fans. Uh, listening. This influenced the early editions of Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, it was going through, look at that guy. Look at that. The beautiful woman soothes the Serpent King. Uh, Lang Cap would, would record, not unlike Grimm or Anderson, he was, you know, recording these fairy tales from all over the, the world and kind of translating them. And, and then, and then um, Ford would illustrate them. And, um, it's in one of these books, Ange, that I found the the one of the giants from the original Dungeons and Dragons, where where Dave Trampier, who we looked at earlier, was obviously just as inspired and copied 
the design. So these these are just these fairy tale books were huge. I poured over these as a kid. Uh, you don't see a lot of originals. I've seen a few of them, but there's we have one here. This is from uh, the story, The Fairy of the Dawn. Among the flowers were lovely maidens calling to him with soft voices. So here we have the original book as it was printed, and this is an early printing. And then here we have a facsimile printed out of uh, Henry Ford's uh, art. We definitely have some white out here. It looks like there was some wrinkles in the dresses that he didn't like. Um, this is insanity. This amount of work and the sheer volume that he was doing in book after book year. These basically came out one a year. You know, it was unbelievable the rate that they put these books out. I suspect they were probably incredibly popular. Um, whoops. Um, what's he working with? This is all brush. So similar to what we saw uh, Frank Frazetta using. You can see some brush work here in the darks. And then he's using also, he may only be using one pen. I could be wrong. I'm not seeing a lot of variance in the line like we saw with Heinrich Klei. It all looks about the same width. So he's using maybe one pen. He could be doing a lot of this with brush. I was wondering about that in the tree. In the tree and the flower. Definitely that's brush. That's pen and ink. It's just, I mean, here's the thing. This this illustration is... Your Alfonso, you're asking, was it reduced from the original? This is the... This is the fin finished printed book. This is the actual printed out size at, at, the, at the size of the original. So yes, it was reduced... A little less than half. I'm going to say that's a 60% inch, probably about 60% from the original. How long do you think it took him to complete a piece like that? Uh, that's a great, there's, this is all in the planning. Uh, he was 41 years old when he did this. Now, granted, he didn't have uh, Instagram. <laughs> he didn't have uh, Tiger uh, King and 9 million other distractions. The, you know, I, I often think that their work ethic was probably a lot better than, than a modern illustrators. But here's the thing. When we look at this at first, we, we see the guy with, with the knight with the horse. Then we kind of see these maidens. They're all pointed. Their arms are outstretched. They're all pointing up to him. Look at that. Three, three, three. And this tree is mimicking that. So this guy's a master, not just of, of ink, but composition. He knows where to ink. So he's, he's putting in details on the horse, but he's leaving a lot of the details off of the maidens. And here's the thing, Ange. We know those are lilies. Or right, daffod. Daffod uh, I don't say or irises. Lilies, or lilies. lilies are irises, right? He's, he's it's all observed, right? Here's the thing. I sound like Joe Biden. Here's the thing, people. Watch when you go in the back. There's three maidens here. There's more maidens. I mean, it just goes on. Look, there's more even back there. Maidens, I found maidens. Look at all the maidens. Like where's Waldo of maidens? That's here's me. That would have all been black. There may have been one or two here. I mean, there are one, two, th there's, look, there's one hiding behind a tree. I gotta get my pen back. I'll use my pencil here. This reminds me of like, they would have these, this image in a magazine and like highlights as, and then you'd be like, what's the spot the difference? One, two, three. Like that only has 12 maidens. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, there's 13, 14. Maidens in this picture, unbelievable. Just the deeper you go, he's got a big heart. He's no, I can't. Just a uh, just so much storytelling. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, hand drawn borders and hand drawn captions. This goes on and on in every single one of these books. It, the man makes me sick. He was so unbelievably talented. I I suspect he would have had. A big influence on Arthur Rackham too, because Rackham. Oh, and then just what is that chainmail? Yeah, and then there's yeah, yeah and then just... let's put some chainmail and the whole nine. Just a unbelievable piece. Um, let's jump to. Um, we're looking at some small art. Let me blow your mind. Let me blow your mind. Okay. Let's just, just mix it up a little bit, okay? Yeah. So Tony takes his headphones out. He runs over. He's got everything. He's been working on this for days, just so everybody knows. He's been, uh, he's got everything laid out on the flat files. Um, so he's got each artist kind of in piles so he can bring it over and for takes, your viewing pleasure. Like a show and tell. We're arting out. We're arting out. It's like you guys are here in the studio with us today. From, from, um, 
Yeah, let me grab. Let me grab one more. Let me grab one more. Come on. This. This. Grab one more. Blowing my mind. Are you kidding me? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go from small to to not so small. This is uh, Ange. This is Charles Dana Gibson. This is undoubtedly a master of pen and ink. Oh my gosh. This is one of his classic Gibson girls. This mm. is um, this one was in its signed. This one was done around 1900. That's when the Gibson girls were quite popular. So he was in his 30s. He's early 30s. This to me is pure illustrative magic of what you can create with pen and ink. This is unbelievable. Here's where it gets crazy though, Ange. The Gibson look, this look. He, so he's, he's drawing a lot of society uh, types in his illustration. And I only have one example, only because there's only so many large prints I could do. This is one of the smaller pieces. And I've seen a few of the originals and they're mind-blowingly awesome. Um, here's the thing. He's drawing society women and then he stylizes them. And then this becomes the look that women of the turn of the century, they want this look. They want their hair like this. They want the makeup like this. He, and it becomes the Gibson girl. And this, it's almost like um, very rarely do we see an artist uh, a two-dimensional artist affect how the the real world becomes. But this would have been, you know, if he was on Instagram, he would have had millions of followers. He would have been like a stylist. He would have been a rock star, 30-something years old, and just the idea of, of doing this. And here's the other thing I love. Look at, like, you get everything. You get the roll of her shoulder. You get a little bit of her bust line. And the other shoulder, but it he does he lets you your brain's filling it all in, unbelievable. I, One that's of, what blows me away. I mean, even just from the neck down, you're like, oh my gosh, like the that the roundness of the shoulders, that yes. silhouette is unbelievable. The sketchiness. There's a little bit of pencil in there that he's using to guide, so it's not like he's again. None of these these guys are or gals are picking up a, a pen and just going. They're penciling it out. He's penciling it out. Someone wanted to know if this is part of the golden age. Absolutely, this is part of the golden age of illustration at the turn of the oh, century nice. of the 1900s going. Even those wisps of hair right at the nape of the neck. I yeah, mean. but it gets pretty stylized. Like, I was kind of surprised this kind of chunky curl here is kind of interesting around her ears. Here's the other thing. The um, two things. This is undoubtedly draw from life. So he either had a model pose. I don't know if he used a lot of photographs. Um, there's no, first of all, he's, She's not head on. Her head is tilted back. How do we know? We can see underneath her chin and we can see the bottom of her nose. So she's looking at, she's looking down at you. Mm -hmm. She's not looking head on at you. Her eyes are downcast. This is a society woman looking down at you. And many of the cartoons and illustrations that he drew were about wealthy society uh, looking down. And often for humor and effect, you had a young, scrappy, poor man trying to woo a wealthy socialite. And, and you can see it just in the simple rendering of this. Either that or it was really short. Oh, <laughs> but I just thought even the weight of the lids, that kind of just like sleepy, sultry. Right. So I, I just... there would have been, you know, women certainly were wearing makeup back then. So, I mean, I think he's definitely emulating that. But the way he's drawing the shadow out, Ange, here, I'm going to try to dry my pen so I don't, totally ruin this when I yeah, scrape on it. Of I mean, um, he's using a very big pen. So I'm using an Imperial nib. These nibs have been around probably as long as Gibson did it. I see maybe some brush. He was probably actually using, using something bigger. He is attacking this when he's going. He, this, is, this looks probably inked, or I'm sorry, brushed. He probably brushed this in. He didn't bother. But th I mean, he is, it's, he's going in and putting in these heavy, heavy darks. And then he's like, all right, let me contour it. So you get the sense of how this feels. This, I, this rendering style, I have swiped and used many times when I render. Oh, and then it's like, oh, and let me just use that negative space for the highlight. On yeah. The curl. Like, oh. he, that's what, here's the thing. He doesn't blast it with white out. He doesn't draw it through and then glop white out. He's stopping and then starting again. And he's stopping, I'm guessing the stroke's coming down because you're getting these little J's on the end of it as he's doing the stroke. 
And then I'm guessing these are all upward strokes. They feel like upward strokes yeah. to me. But, um, and then he's, okay, let me do it. This is what's killer. This kind of, it's fast. It's real fast. And it's very, almost like a machine. You're precise. You're just incrementally moving at a millimeter. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, he, once, there's such a confidence here in the way he illustrates. Well, really. Look at the delicacy in the line of As the it, lip, too. Absolutely. And again, I think he's either letting the pen run out of ink, which is a technique when you know the pen's starting to run out of ink and the ink line will skip. Or he's purposely, like Frank Frazetta did, adding water to the ink so the th the line gets thinner and thinner because it's care it's almost all pure water with just barely a little bit of pigment in it. Mm. So here's a, a Gibson. Uh, I have seen quite a few originals. I wanted to print out a big original for you guys, but I was running out of paper to be honest. <laughs> um, as you'll, and you'll find out why soon. Um, what I can tell you, though, in some of the Gibsons that I've seen, the originals, big scene. So imagine her. Now imagine her in a crowd. That's how in, unbelievably detailed these images were. I've seen where he literally would cut out the entire figure, paste in another sheet of paper and redraw it. So lots of corrections back then. Here's another artist from around the same time, Ange. Also get ready to have your mind blown. He was a newspaper illustrator. And I'm super excited to share this one because a book just came out collecting his work. His name was Thomas uh, J. Sullivan. Thomas J. Sullivan, another huge influence on Disney. And if you think our man uh, Gibson worked big, I had to print this one on two sheets of paper to try to get it so you guys can see it. Let me see if I can pan out just big enough so you can see the entire illustration. Yeah, we got most of it there. This is... Believe it or not, an illustration for a newspaper, most likely Harper's, which is who he did he did a lot of work for, so the equivalent of the New Yorker magazine. I'm going to put my hand here just so you guys get a sense of how big Thomas Sullivan worked. Unbelievable. These are masterpieces of pen and ink. Sullivan, um, as I said, just had his work collected in a, in a, a huge book collecting all his work. Um, that just came out by from Fantagraphics. I'll post the info. I think I posted uh, news of it on the site a week or two ago when it came out. His his originals are rare. We don't see them. I think you and I in our years of collecting have only seen maybe one or two, and they were about this about this beat up or more. Here's what I love about this beautiful big scan. We can really see how Sullivan worked. Now here, I'm guessing this is just brush. He's just using a real fine. Russian I too. see so much. I mean, so much influence on you in these pieces. And then on top of it, I know we had we had an episode we talked about uh, anthropomorphizing animals. Yeah. I mean, he's a master. So he's going in. He's going in, Ange, with a brush. Yep. Yes, I have copies that I've sat down and copied his stuff. And I was going to pull them out, but I just didn't want to slow us way down. But the other thing I want to talk about with him that's really spectacular is he did not use whiteout at all. Instead, he used a technique called scratch out. So he would go in with a blade and scratch away the ink. So if you look, you're seeing raw texture around the elephant's eyes and face. He's gone in and scratched out. Here, here's, a be here's another shot of it. Look between, look here between this rock and the tiger's tail, and you can see the scarring of where he scratched out. Probably was another rock, and he didn't like the way it was interfering with the tail, the silhouette of this tiger. So he's gone in and scratched the whole thing out. This thing is littered with scars where he's either scratched it out or erased it out. Lots of working and reworking. And the eye, I love that. This is what makes me the happiest, Andrew. I'm always messing up eyes. He gets one eye right, he screws up the other eye. So he scratches it out. Because you're removing permanent ink. It's the only way to do it is to go in with a blade and scrape away the ink. And that's what he's doing here. No white out. Scraping it away. Something so much work. These animals reminds me of uh, like in Zootopia. The animals in Zootopia. I would say, um, well, Disney, oh, here's another thing. So um, Disney was also influenced by uh, Sullivan as well. Um, there's, there's Sullivan originals in the Disney archive along with Heinrich Klei. I think Disney just loved anthropomorphic animals. If you don't see Dumbo in this, yeah. right? I mean, um, and definitely, I would say um, Chris Saunders, who I don't, yes. he, he, he definitely is looking at, um, who came from Disney. 
He designed Lilo and Stitch. He would have done Bolt, um, How to Train Your Dragon. I'm seeing shapes and forms that are very uh, reminiscent of Chris Saunders' work here. This is a... Uh, yes, Animalia. Yeah, yeah. Just an unbelievable uh, opportunity. I also like this right here at the bottom. That's a pinhole, and he's just sat and doodled on it. Just probably, I maybe on the phone, not sure. Sullivan was, I didn't write the dates on this. Um, this one that was undated. They didn't know what date, what year it was from. My, my hunch is, though, um, he was active into the late, I think the late 20s or early 30s. So again, golden age of illustration. He would have been a contemporary uh, with Gibson. And one of his biggest contemporaries was another illustrator who had a tremendous influence on me, a man named Arthur uh, B. Frost, A.B. Frost. Um, A.B. Frost and Sullivan knew each other. They were friends. Frost would go on to illustrate, he's, he, one of his first books he illustrated, Andrew, was Lewis, a Lewis Carroll uh, story called, I believe, Phantasmagoria. It's a ghost story. He would go on to illustrate the Uncle Remus books. They were incredibly successful and popular. He did a lot of images of sporting and sports fishermen. I mean, but what I wanted you, these, these are two people who, who are working side by side, who know each other. Um, this is a panel of a cartoon. So Frost did a lot of cartoons uh, with multiple panels. This is leading up to Windsor McKay, who's getting ready to do Little Nemo, or they're all kind of all living in the same world. So this is one of, I believe, eight panels. So he would have done these in um, a sketchbook. And, and when I looked at the archive, there was every page of the, you know, of the sketchbook had a panel on it. Um, this was called Mulaney's Mully's Cow. It was done in 1892. Frost was 41 years old when he did this. So here's the thing that, that happened that affects both of these artists, Ange, during their lifetime. Uh, Moybridge, the photographer, does the famous photograph of the person running and the horses running, and we see those frames of the people running and moving in time. And that has, it was a sensation, and it has a tremendous effect on artists like these two who are all about let's capture movement in our art. And this this here is the roots of animation. This is the beginning. This is leading into the beginning of, of really dynamic animation. Uh, Frost, believe it or not, um, would have used a very small pen. He's very sketchy. Um, another one, I, this is what I love with Frost's work. This little just, eh, it's just, it's, it's just, it's grass. It's very, I love how he's, getting the nib, making sure the nib's good to go. That's a great indicator here for us of what kind of nib he probably was using because you can see the he's testing how thin it can go and then how thick it can go based on how hard you press press down. Um, just a real master. I, this this kind of, just all this vertical gives it so much height. The beautiful draftsman. I love his work. Very influential on Spiderwick, actually. I know we talk about Rackham a lot for Spiderwick, but really if you look at the rendering style, there's a lot of A.B. Frost in, in my rendering style um, for Spiderwick. All right, I'm going to grab some more. You guys enjoying it, I hope? I think they're digging it for sure. Okay, good. good. I'm excited to see who's next. All right, well, let's, um, we're moving forward in time. Uh, let's go from very, very big. To very, very, ooh, tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Oh, awesome. You guys are loving it. Great. Good. Dare I say, Ange, we're going to go from very, very large to very, very small. I'd almost say curiouser. I mean, that's a huge piece. What would he have been working on here? Full sheets of whatever uh, this is. Sheet, yeah, yeah, board. Yeah. All right. We're going to go from very, very big to very, very tiny. We're going to get curiouser and curiouser with the grand, one of the grandmasters, uh, John Tenniel, who was knighted, knighted, sir. he became Sir John, and you know, with with Elton John and and people like that, and Conan Doyle. Let's see if I can get my Alice book to stay on this little lip here, so I can bring this in nice and tight for you guys, so you can see it really well. That looks pretty good on our rinky dink uh, operation here. This is a. Uh, uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is not a first edition. It's an early edition, though. What kind of paper do you think they were working on? 
I would say they worked on all kinds of pay. It, it, it varied. Um, it depended on, um, I, I don't know the British, um, uh, supplies as well as the American. Um, I know a lot of the British illustrators like Arthur Rackham worked on Watman illustration board, which doesn't, I don't think exists anymore. Um, but it's similar to the Bristol board I use now. It had a little bit of a coating on it so that they could, it's super smooth. It's super slick. So when you're inking it, that nib just moves. It's not catching on anything. Uh, this is probably one of the most famous children. This is probably the most famous children's book of all time, Ange. Um, if not one of the most famous books of all time, uh, everyone knows Alice in Wonderland. Everyone, uh, myself included, have grown up with, uh, if you're a fan of Alice, probably grew up with Sir John Tenniel's, uh, beautiful drawings. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, these finished images that we see in Alice in Wonderland are are not executed by Tenniel, though he is the one who is credited with illustrating. Because Alice is one of the older books. This is from 18, I believe 1865 is when the first Alice book is done. I think 1867, 68 is when the second Alice book comes out. Tenniel worked for a magazine called Punch in London. Uh, which is, you know, kind of a funny satire. Think of Saturday Night Live in a magazine, like National Lampoon, things like that. Very, very popular. Lampooning politics. Politics and everything else. Yeah. So um, when he was hired to illustrate Alice in Wonderland, he had a working relationship with um, woodcutters. And um, these engravers would have made the wood blocks that would have been used for printing. So this would have been set like an old... When you see the rows of wood, you know, of the type and everything set with wood blocks, and this would be a little wood block print, and they're printing off the book. Uh, we've got a lot, he's, he's incredibly archived, so we've got a lot of neat stuff I can show you here. This is at 100%. So Tenniel's working in probably the equivalent of a moleskin sketchbook. Where um, did you pull these images from? I'm just curious. I, the, these came from a variety of sources. So the uh, Morgan Library in New York City has quite a collection. Um, the British Museum has... Um, some elements that we're going to see as well. So this came, I believe, from the Morgan Library. This is the uh, one of the preliminary sketches for the White Rabbit, but it also has the preliminary sketch for Alice here looking in. Uh, once she gets the key, she's trying to get... This is right before she um, eats the, the drink, drinks the drink me bottle and the eat me cake to try to get to the right size to get through the doorway here. Uh, when she goes down the rabbit hole, so you can see a little sketch here where he's trying to figure it out as well as... A little, a little, looks like a little pen and ink on top of probably a pencil drawing of uh, the White Rabbit. He worked incredibly small. Once he had that sketch down, Ange, the way he was, he was ready for it to go to go to press. He would I'm trying to do this here without. I mean that original little drawing of that of the White Rabbit that looks what three inches. Well, yeah, I mean it's so tiny. Guess what it is. A hundred. Well, it's a hundred percent. He had to work a hundred percent. He had to work a hundred percent. There was no enlarging or reducing here. This had to all be done at actual size. And to show you what I mean, let's go back to uh, Alice here, trying to get through the darn door. Yeah, where is she? We lost her. There she is. Here is Tenniel's final drawing. This is his final drawing for this illustration. And you'll notice a couple things. One, it's backwards. Mm -hmm. Two, once we get right on top of it, it is in pencil. It is in pencil on paper. It's a pencil drawing. This is the final illustration that Tenniel would have done. Well, actually, I take that back. There's one more step. The next step Tenniel would have done once the sketch was approved, this final drawing, he would have transferred it to a block of wood, traced it onto a block. So this drawing then with the final version of his drawing that he would complete would have been on a block of, I think, basswood is what these very really, uh, finely grained wood, okay? Then the engravers took over, the Dalzio brothers. The Dalzio brothers would then do an engraving, and from that engraving, they would print... So here's a Dalziel print. This is from a, a series of proofs that were found and are now at the British Museum. Uh, they found a set of proofs. So if we look here, 
we see this looks like a bunch of gibberish. It actually says Dalziel. So it's the Dalziel firm who's done the engravings of John's uh, pencil drawing. And then again, these are actual sites. But here's what's amazing. So his, you know, I don't have a first edition, but there's definitely, what you know, degradation in the line, especially when you compare it to a, a proof, which would have been the first thing they pulled off the block. They would have put a piece of paper, run it through the press to see how it looks. So you you can see how much is is dropping away, falling away. Even their signature gives you an idea. These blocks would wear out, Ange. That's really just what would happen. I mean, they're just wood. Um, they would use a process called electrotype, which is basically where they would make a mold of the wood engraving in metal, like a, I'm guessing a copper, and um, and they would use that. But even those 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 metal plates would wear out. So. See, Emily C. Martin said, I thought they were metal engravings. Yes. Well, it would have been a metal on top of a block of wood, though. There, I did do a little research. I did, again, I couldn't go too deep because we're covering so many, but it sounded like there was a discussion between when the Dalziels were hired to do this, whether Carol wanted it in wood or in metal. And um, Carol, I think, chose wood, which they said in the end was a smart move because the wood actually lasts longer than the metal, or I've got it backwards. The metal lasts longer than the wood, I'm not sure. But whatever it was, it w because they did not anticipate the book to be such a huge sensation, what Carol chose was, was quantity over quality. Whatever he chose didn't have the, the highest uh, quality, but was able to last longer in the printing process, if that at all makes any sense. Uh, Tenniel was... I have the info on that. He, uh, 1865, he was 45 years old when he illustrated Alice in Wonderland. He would have been hugely successful. I don't know if he was knighted yet. I'm not sure when he got knighted or for what reason. I can assume it was probably for his contributions to Punch as well as Alice in Wonderland. I have one more. There's, there's loads of examples of his work on the internet that you can find. Uh, Morgan Library, as I said, has an incredible... This was always my favorite character, as Angel tell you, the Mad Hatter. Here he's singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat. I have the, uh, the sketch here. Here's the sketch of the Mad Hatter for Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat. What I love about these process sketches is you get, you get these little bits going on on the side where you're just sorting stuff out. These, are, these sketches are for later illustrations. There's a scene later with the rat, uh, Hatter holding a cup of tea. And I believe this is probably a bow off the white rabbit. So um, again, we see it. What's interesting here is, again, I have a later, I don't have a first printing of the book. So his, his signature, his monogram here, the, the JT, John Tenniel, probably uh, was in the final edition. But here all we got is the Dalziel's uh, note. Here's the uh, engraver's proof for this. Let's uh, switch it up here so you can look. So you guys can see these side by side. And we can see the engraver's proof next to a final printed version. Again, a lot of loss of kind of a degradation. But, um, you know, Teenage Tony was copying out of this book a lot, copying these old tenniel drawings and, and mimicking this cross-hatching technique. Um, so this technique that he used actually leads me to uh, a demo. Here's another early. So we have a couple stages. I don't know if this one I printed at the proper size. Let's check. Where is advice from a caterpillar? Here it is. Very famous image. I was hoping to find the final image of this one, Ange, but unfortunately, all I could find was the sketch. Yeah, it looks like it's about the right size. Maybe a little bigger. This looks like probably his preliminary sketch, and then he would have done the hard drawing afterward to prepare it for the, for the engraving. So this is what he would do, Ange. This is amazing that they have this information out there. So once, Dalsy, uh, once John Tenniel knew what he was going to do, and I, he needed to keep these lines almost like instructions to the, the engravers. The, the tighter the line, the more um, information, the more he's controlling actually what they engrave. So how did he do it? <laughs> Believe it or not, it took a while to get. He did it with a 6H pencil. This is uh, a very extremely hard graphite pencil. We're going to zoom in a little bit here, see if we can actually 
do a little demo a la Mr. John Tenniel. I'm going to attempt to draw at the size of Mr. John Tenniel. Let's see if I can pull it off. I don't know if I can, but I'll give it a go. Um, the, this process was exacting, not just on John, because he was blind in one eye from a fencing accident. Wow. How very amazing. <laughs> Um, but also oh, these guys would work. I'm not even going to be able to do this without putting my nose to the paper, but I'll give it a go. Um, these guys, I mean, it, that face is so tiny. And I'm using the same pencil he'd use. It is, it's not even a mechanical pencil. Angie. It is so like, I'm going to press down as hard as I can just to give you a sense. That's me pressing as hard as I can. Here's a, just to, for contrast, here's a number two regular See the difference in line quality? Oh, here. Here's a number two. I'm going to do, I'm pressing down as hard as I can on this number two, right? I, I, if, I, if I use a light touch, I can do some fine lines. However, it's smearing. See? I can smear it. This is the 6H, 6 hardness that, that Tenniel is using. This is me pressing as hard as I can, Ange. Wow. Okay? Barely any movement of the pay, of the uh, graphite. This is why John used this. So what he's what is he doing? He's inking with a pencil. He's I included him in our masters of pen and ink because he is working just like any artist who would ink. I try to do like so he's doing like this. It's what I read was the woodcutters and um the people that would work at these firms would lose their eyesight because it was so unbelievably exacting. But he's going in and really, really, you can see I'm just kind of, these beautiful little delicate lines, it's, it's unbelievable, very, very tough. Um, I'm, I wondered if he used some kind of magnifying lens. I sure would need one to do this, but you get the idea here, I'll try to, sketch out the rim, but you can see why he had to plan these so carefully. He doesn't want any of this construction line, Ange. He doesn't want that. He wants it done. I know he wants it to be, I know exactly what I have to draw. I have to draw this line here, this line here, because I need the engravers to understand exactly how I want it engraved. I want a series of fine strokes here, you know, and so on and so forth. So to give you a little bit of an idea, oops, sorry. There's my really horrible, but again, I'm, this pencil is like drawing with a pen. It really is. It's like a gray pen that you can erase. So there's a little bit of Mr. Uh, Tenniel. Ooh, who's next? Well, let's see. <laughs> Are you having fun yet, Anne? You guys having a good time? Any questions, let me know. I will share yeah. them with Tony. Yeah. Hey, speaking of, of his being back and neck must have been wrecked. I'm sure. What's that? His neck? Yeah, his back and neck must. Oh have been yeah, wrecked. maybe a comfortable uh, seating. You want to know surprisingly who else worked like this? You're not going to believe. We're going to jump way forward in time. We're going to jump all over time, so don't worry. I've got some some oldies but goodies that we'll get to. Get a load of this, Ange. Let me pan out a little. This is. I bet. I bet some. There's some people here that know what this is from. See if anybody here knows what book this is from. This you would you would swear this is a book from a hundred years ago. You would swear it. Look at that fine hatchwork, very similar to Mr. John Tenniel. You would swear this had been inked a hundred years ago. This is. I didn't write it on the back. This is from uh, probably the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, 1960s. This is from the master himself, Maurice Sendak. This is from A Kiss for Little Bear, one of the Little Bear books. You know what gave it away for me looking at that? That wall. That like wall. Something about that wall, the way he this that wall. This is why I chose this piece and the next Sendak piece I'm going to share with you all today. This, I didn't realize how much of an influence Sendak had on me until you look at how Sendak crosshatches and how he crosshatches are these little patches. And I do that all the 
time give, and I didn't even give, give, give yourself a little pat on the back for how you track down these images give a little shout out this one's pretty yes we wanted to give a shout out to our friends at the University of Connecticut actually yeah. the University of Connecticut UConn for short has acquired uh, much of Maurice's work and uh, it's available for research and and things like that so I had to I had to you know, tell them I'm not going to sell prints or do anything commercial with it. It's purely for education. But Tony reached out for our Drawn to Fantasy friends. You contacted UConn this week. I contacted, yes. For, 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 uh, for the sake of you guys, I reached out to U University of Connecticut and asked them, I, w and ex not expecting to get an answer, because I also re reached out to the British Museum for the John Tenniel stuff, and in the end, uh, was able to just find high-res versions elsewhere, but I would have liked to have worked directly with the British Museum. But it's okay. Who am I? Um, we got what we got. And uh, so these are um, Little Bear. I'm going to guess these are at 100%. I, do I have a Little Bear book? Up? I don't have a Little Bear, Bear book here with me. But my money is, this is looks like pretty much like an 8.5 by 11-ish sheet of paper. Maybe I'm wrong. This looks like it's at 100%. This looks like page 9 is at 100%. He drew it right to same size. Unfortunately, I don't have this Little Bear book uh, handy. Um, here's what I love about this piece movement. And we were talking about movement early, earlier. Um, look at the movement of this hen, the illustration prior to this, uh, grandma bear is holding the hen in her lap. And so this one here, the hen, she gives the kiss. Remember she, I don't know if you remember this one, the kid, the little bear gives her the drawing with a kiss and the kiss kind of gets passed on through the book. Everyone keeps kissing. It's all for, from little bear. So the grandma bear gives the hen a kiss and he's clearly not happy about that. <laughs> Uh, or the rooster, I should say. Anyway, just the movement is just so terrific here. Um, also, you've got this beautiful white negative space where the drawing is that Little Bear's done. And then really some nice dense uh, ink work here to keep your eyes up here where the action is. But he doesn't hold back down here. So you've got like shades of gray. I mean, you've got some very, very fine. Let me switch. I in. love that the drawing on the paper is like a wild thing. Yes, yes. This may predate or I'm not sure in the timeline. I feel bad that I didn't get the date on this one. I'm not sure if this predates or comes after Wild Things. I Maybe after, Ange. So he's definitely using a very fine nib. And and this is very exacting work. This is very time-consuming. I'm going to guess this piece, the execution, not the planning, not the sketching, not the transferring, just the, okay, I'm ready to ink, probably took a better part of a day to ink. Um, I, again, I'm stunned when I look at this and again, l l I'm going to put my hand next to it so you get a sense of the size that he worked at for this. Um, when the Eric Carl Museum, uh, opened the debut exhibition was Maurice Sendak. And I remember how gobsmacked I was by the artistry, the real masterful pen and ink work that Maurice, uh, exhibited. I'm also not seeing a whole lot of white out. In this one, I'm guessing there's a little bit he's added, a little bit of white in here, just to probably define the chin. I'm seeing a little bit of white brushed in on her brooch. Um, maybe on her muzzle here, it's hard to tell. Sendak's biggest influence was William Blake, correct? Uh, Blake was one. He collected etchings. He loved uh, Durr, and he loved Doré, and, um, and he loved uh, Beatrix Potter. Um, huge fan of Beatrix, obsessed with Beatrix Potter. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing a lot of, of others, but those fine etchings by, um, uh, Durr and Doorway, there's some, there's some white out going on here. We can see it all going on Gene in here. Gene Wagman said, a kiss for little bear is 1968, which is after a while thing. Yes. Thank you. Thank that. you. Thank you for that. Melody. That's it. I knew someone would, would hop to it. I've got another example. Now, I, I could have shown you something from Wild Things. We all know Wild Things, which is why I wanted to show you something that wasn't Wild Things. But I wanted to show you one from one of my favorite books that he did. Um, it's a little quirky picture book he did called Hector Protector. And as I went over the water, Sendak did a couple of these, Ange. Oh my God, I forgot I'm not plugged in. God, I don't even know if you guys could hear me this whole time. Sorry about that. I forgot to plug Mike, Mike back in. Sorry about that. Um, this is another one of my favorite little books that uh, Sendak did. Uh, it's called Hector Protector. And as I went over there, he did a couple of these kind of um, little quirky picture books where he would take two nursery rhymes and kind of do a mashup, if you will. So very ahead of his time, Ange. He's doing the, the mix before there was such a thing, right? 
want to make sure I'm, I don't I don't know if I'm zoomed in. I want to make sure I'm not zoomed in. I want to zoom out. So Hector Protector, it's not a very big picture book. It's pretty small. Um, this came out, I think, just a couple years after Wild Things. Let's look. So the technique is very similar to what he used in Wild Things. It's 1965. I think Wild Things is 64. Someone can correct me. Maybe 67. I always I can never quite remember. I know it's mid to late 60s when he does, but there's a lot of similar. The, the execution here is very similar to the execution in Wild Things. There's your hatching again, Ange. And in the night kitchen. Night Kitchen's like, I think, 1970, mm -hmm. but not as much. He doesn't do any hatching, mm -hmm. but the one thing he does, he does one thing here different than he did in Wild Things. We're going to look at this page spread right here. 63. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So a couple of years after Wild Things, we're going to look at this original. It's actually enlarged. So he worked a little smaller, and they blew it up. They enlarged it. This I'm going to guess... I feel like I've seen posters that he's done for book festivals or the New York Public Library. Yeah. Let me just turn my phone down so you guys can see this in all its amazing glory. Bear with me here. There we go. Um, so this is the original. Uh, it looks like it's on a watercolor paper. It's on arches. We can tell because we can see the uh, stamp here. So, so if somebody wanted to know what uh, paper he's inking on, it's an Arches uh, paper. We could probably even find out what kind that is. Um, and he's definitely cut it up. You can see the raw deckled edge where the paper would have come in a full sheet. And he's just trimming it up as he's going along. Um, he's got a non-photo, um, what I'm going to assume is a trim line for the art. Um, unlike Wild Things... So for the wild things, the art would have looked very similar. However, he would have then just watercolored straight on top of the ink drawing edge. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, he did an overlay. So think of an acetate overlay with the watercolor applied. Um, so you had two different... So this would have printed on the black plate. So when they print a book, it's CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. So he can keep the line super crisp by just printing this on the black plate only. It keeps the line very, very sharp. As you can see here, that's how he's able to achieve that very sharp line. Mm -hmm. Whereas if he printed it in a four color process, the line would be, the black would be made, it would have a little yellow, it'd have a little blue, have a little red in it, so it gets a little softer. So clearly he's thinking like a, a cartoonist or a comic book artist while he's working on this. Um, so it's executed very, uh, in a very similar um, style that he would have executed the wild things, but the final uh, preparation for printing would have been different. So here we see, um, how the coloring was applied in an overlay. But it allows us to, to get rid of the color and just focus on just the pen work. That wasn't reduced, that was actually... It's actually enlarged, okay. yes, yes. Now, I could be off. I mean, I tried to, you know, all these things. Um, I actually, Ange heard me speaking on the phone early this morning. I talked to uh, Nick Clark, who was used to be the, uh, the head and the... the founding curator of the, of the Eric, Eric Carl Museum. And, uh, and I wanted... That works uh, very closely, works with uh, Ashley Bryan. Ashley Bryan. And I wanted to know when you see the dimensions of this, um, of artwork listed in a, either in a auction house or in a, in a museum or some kind of holdings, what do, are they actually listing the dimensions from the edge of the artwork? Are they listing the dimensions uh, or the edge of the, of the, sh the, the sheet of paper or is it the edge of the artwork? And he said there was actually no easy answer. It, it really depended. When we did it for the um, Norman Rockwell Museum, we measured the physical paper. Well, sometimes they'll say image measures at. Yes. Overall measurement is. Yeah. Um, I was just looking up something on Heritage the other day, and I remember specifically. Sometimes it'll tell and you. And then they will say, like, matted image is. Yes. Blah, blah, blah. Frame size is. Yes. Usually More information, usually the better. I'm going to guess, um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of, of correction on here. Looks like Sendak knew what he was doing. This is prime Sendak. He's, um, I didn't write the year. I, didn't, I meant to write how old he was when he did these. Um, I'm sure someone will be able to look it up. But, um, you know, he's in full force. I'm guessing it looks like maybe two... It looks like he's doing the outline with one sort of nib, and then he's coming in with a finer nib to do the detail work. So probably two pens. Um, I dare say maybe a brush for the thicker because it's got a kind of a, a lumpy, especially if you look at that pot. 
There's a little bit of lumpiness to the line that suggests that it's done with a brush, a very fine brush is what I'm guessing. But definitely two, at least two implements, maybe more. And that's how he's doing it. But huge influence on me, especially with picture books. There's not a lot of people who can who can do it like this these days. Barbara McClintock comes to mind. Sophie Blackall comes to mind. Brian Floca comes to mind. Some pretty terrific uh, illustrators out there. All right, I'm going to switch gears. Um, oh, you know what? I got a good one. Hold on. Ooh. Who's next? Who's next? <laughs> Let's go to his... Oh, his... yay! Let's go to his... Uh... Should I just put this, just put this out? Yeah. Just start with that. They're one of my all time faves. I feel like we're zoomed. Ah, I knew it was zoomed out. There we go. I knew it zoomed in. There we so go. Good. There it is. So good. One of the best. A classic. They're all good. You're right, Kevin. Yeah, we're trying to just show you some. A contemporary of Maurice, probably maybe a little bit earlier than Maurice was Garth Williams. Um, Garth illustrated a lot of famous books for young uh, readers. This being probably the most famous book of all. I would, I would say as far as American children's literature, this is our Winnie the Pooh. This is our, you know, our, our, our big classic uh, chapter book for children. And um, I am uh, super excited to share with you the cover, the cover image of Charlotte's Web. It's full of all kinds of amazing details. Um, fun, interesting note. Uh, pretty much all of the Garth Williams estate original art was sold at auction. Yep. Um, gosh, what, eight, nine years ago? Yeah, quite a bit. Years ago? I'd have yeah. to look up. Um, so, I mean, this is amazing. This is, I assume, a scan from Heritage Auctions. Yep. Um, we got from some. the estate, but he also illustrated um, Little House on the Prairie, uh, gosh, Stuart Little, yeah. The Rescuers, Cricket in Times Cricket Square. Times Square. Um, but I love that you can see all of his notes around this. We're going to get into that big time. It's really, really amazing to see this. This is one of the larger pieces uh, from Charlotte's Web. The other uh, originals, we're going to look at another one. Um, they were a little smaller. Um, I this, that title treatment. how about that title treatment? And he's got notes here, which I'm trying to, I got to get a lip for this thing here to yeah. ho hopefully it'll stay. So he says, I don't know what VB, but he says red letters on the shine for Charlotte's red web. Well, they didn't follow that red on the cover for Stuart little green letters on the cover for Garth Williams. They did that. So they did it. So if you look here, they used the red for Stuart little and green on Garth. And that's according to his notes here. He did do Trumpet and the Swan as well. That's right. He's got Harper on the side. Yeah, it looks like they kept that, but they changed it to Harper and Row. So this might be a later printing. Um, he's got the little Charlotte on the spine, which is all there. You can kind of see how he... Oh, he's talking about the spine. Red letters on the spine. That's what he's saying. So he says here, red letters on the spine for Charlotte's Web. And that's that's what they did. Ours is just so darn old, it's all faded and and nasty. I collect a lot of old books because I want to look at exactly how they made it. I want to look at the kerning and the lettering and yes. all that kind of fun stuff. But there's not a lot of white out. Charlotte's, or I'm sorry, Fern's jaw has I mean, been whited out. I mean, look at that. Like a designer would have to just work so hard to come up with that as a font. And he's... Yeah. Hand lettered it. That's that's Spider on the Fly, Ange. I mean, it's, that's basically what uh, I did for Spider on the Fly. Gosh. And and they tilt and he did it at a tilt, so you can see now their designers correcting the tilt. So if I hold it straight up on the phone here, that's straight up. So I've got my edges, and then you can see the angle here where the designers like, yeah, we're gonna take that, or just gonna tilt it and make it a little more straight. And that's what they end up doing in the final. See, Garth used a ton of whiteout. Loads of it. Um, He's got all kinds of notes. This was the uh, Eric Carle Museum. After the Charlotte's Web auction, there was an auctioning, as Ange said, of, of his work. Um, the Eric Carle Museum um, had an exhibition 
of it. And it was so amazing to see all the artwork in one room. It's something that should have been done during Garth's light, lifetime, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. so, so this iconic piece of American literature has now, all of the original artwork for it has, has dispersed. To the four winds. Throughout the world. Garth did this in 1952. He was 40 years old, Ange, when he, when he did this. I'm hoping some of our younger listeners, I don't think age is a huge factor for some of these. I think there's gained understanding of anatomy and observation and, and, and the ability to draw without really thinking. He's not, you know what I mean? Like the thinking's done. He's just drawing it out at this point. Um, but I hope everyone can see that, you know, a lot of these, they're not, aside from Gibson, who was 30, most of these artists were in their 40s. Oh, or I older. See, I actually had this conversation. I did a, a, an online event last night. There was a woman um, who, Pat Zietlow Miller, who is an author, and she said he, she wrote her first children's book, I believe, at 39. There you go. I was like, you know what? Julia Child started cooking at 40. There Eric Carle wrote and illustrated The Very Hungry Caterpillar at 40. There you go. There you go. Uh, one of my favorite illustrations, when the... Um, Charlotte makes one of her first uh, signs. Her uh, and we have the original for this. All the originals, this is by the yes, way. White out or white ink? No, it is. Oh, I think it's white. It's There's white no out. white out on this one, um, but there were loads of it on some of the others. Um, I mean, this is basically an eight and a half by eleven illustration, and, and even then, it's a little larger than the final. Um, me, you know, obviously they reduced it. Um, I don't know if Garth's intention, because the trim size looks very similar to the trim of the book. If I line, you guys, ready for part two? <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug this in. Oh, oh. oh. okay. Let's see. I'm gonna plug us in real quick, Ange. All right, we're back. Holy cow, we're back. That was some. Yes, you guys. I think we did break the internet. There we go. Hello again. Give everybody. Let's take some we'll questions. We'll give you guys a minute to uh, to get back. Yeah, let's to take a couple. We, we can take a couple questions. Uh, we're not, you know. Uh, full disclosure: I I got a new phone this week. My other phone had been acting up. I, I it was a fairly new phone, but I was having problems with it. And uh, I haven't done. I've probably had this new phone what two days. So it could be just a weird... No, not even two days. You just got this yesterday. I got everything migrated yesterday. You're right. So it could be... It's just glitchy. It just dropped and uh, we couldn't get it to go back. It, like it couldn't see... It couldn't see the live option. Whatever. We're here. We're back. We're back. And uh, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, we can... And we were building up to the the, to the big three. Some of my, my, my most favorite of all time before we... Uh, before we call it a day. Um, so we were talking about um, Charlotte's Web, and I'll, I'll wait. You want me to wait a little bit, Ange, before sure. we get up there? Some questions. If you guys have any questions, um, let us know. Yeah. And Tony can be... Yeah. So, okay, so my question is this. So somebody sees all this, they're super inspired. Yep. They want to start working with pen and ink. Yep. They've never worked with pen and ink before. Yeah. What is the best tool to start with? Um, you know, I, even to this day, Ange, I still love a ballpoint pen. I still love my, uh, Which, by the way, was a Shel Silverstein favorite, right? He worked yeah. with just ballpoint pen, like big pens. Yep. But you I, use a, what is that? I use a Pilot Precise. It's a, it's extra fine. Uh, here's why I like it. I mean, I've used the dip pens that I'm showing you guys. I did all the Spiderwick books with dip pens. I've done other books with dip pens. All the D&D &D work, a lot of it I did with dip pens. But this is fast. I don't have to deal with dipping and, and, and drawing. I just draw like crazy. Um, but that said, uh, I have to say, having, having looked at all this art this week, <laughs> I'm inclined to go back to the dip pen. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's, you find what works for you. What I really wanted to show you was even though these are older illustrators that had an, in, yes, in, pen, not big pen. that had a been, uh, had an impact on me, they worked at all different sizes. Um, some of them worked in different media. A lot of them worked with the, with the dip pens. Um, I'm not, I'm guessing that's what Garth's doing here. He's using a dip pen. Um, what I was thinking, Ange, before he, uh, before he, uh, before we got cut out here, was the, uh, the, I'm looking at these non, what they call non-photo blue lines. So this is drawn in a, in a light blue that the camera would not have seen. Um, this, this shade of blue, it's almost like a green screen, Ange, in a way. 
this this it turn out. it would drop out so when they were taking probably what they took for these was a photo stat which was a type of photograph that was just black and on white paper and um and it's super highly contrasty and they would have used that to make the printing plate for this book so the this blue line wouldn't have shown up um but when i look at that blue line and i look at the the actual size of the pages if you look here you can see it looks like garth actually wanted this thing to print larger and they reduced it or this version of the book it's just reduced question was he doing a pencil sketch of this first yes yeah, we're looking at finished pieces. I don't have, this was where I had to draw the line. Like I'm, we're looking at just finished art today, but maybe we'll do one where we break it down really into process and show like we did with the John Tenniel. Like we can see some sketches. We can see some, we can look at the book. We can look at the, um, we can look at the, the work along the way, some of the process. But, um, you know, this is. Uh, Garth did a lot of sketching in pencil. A lot of sketches. We could do a Garth Williams episode because we, we uh, were able to get some of his sketches and book dummies uh, in these auctions, which are pretty neat. Uh, I have one other Garth Williams uh, piece, another pretty iconic one to share with you. Did I bring it over? Is it buried over here and I didn't realize it? Hold on, wait for it. It's a good one. Ooh, which one? Now I'm curious. Okay, hold on, let me grab it. Okay, great. Okay. Oh yeah, there it is. Yes, so when I say that the uh, Garth Williams estate sold uh, Garth's original illustrations, I mean everything went to auction. Here's a... Every sketch, book dummies, drawings, yeah. pen and ink, finished artwork, paintings, covers, study all of it went to auction so you can actually find some of it sometimes it'll even pop up uh, on ebay on the second market with second, um yeah. on ebay yep um you'll see drawings i will tell you to keep an eye out because uh some of this artwork both garth williams um, sendak. As well as sendak and dr seuss we definitely have seen a lot of Forger. forgeries um, because there's a lot of money to be made in collecting original illustrations from a lot of these great artists. That's right. So this is uh, a very famous character that he illustrated um, in a book also written by E.B. Uh, e. White. This is Stuart Littleange. <laughs> Look at this thing. Just a, such an iconic image on this little sheet of paper. I mean, look at this thing. I'm guessing it was a... Looks like, yeah, see, it's the same size here, so he might have trimmed the paper. Is that his whiteout? Did he change his, his... All right, so yeah, so here we go. This is, I wanted to show you one. This I wanted to take a very iconic image, like this one of Stuart, and show you how much correcting is going on. Look at that from the, um, let me grab my little, my pointer slash uh, crow quill. We can see, he didn't, he, he didn't like how far the whiskers went out. Here, he, he didn't like the angle. Like he's really tweaking it hard. All the muzzle in the nose, all around the eye and the ears, a lot of second thinking. He must have, this is either maybe an early one in the process, um, or he just was having an off day. I'm not sure. There's a lot of correction going on in this one. Maybe he knew it was a very iconic image. Um, I will say. He okay. did this one in 1945. He was 33 when he did this, so he was a younger artist. He's looking backwards over his shoulder, but his body looks like it's forward. It is. It's it's the next broken. It, yeah. It'd be impossible for him. But I mean, again, it's it's kind of a human body with a mouse head. But that's kind of the appeal of Stuart Little. Absolutely. Um, tail. Just so cool to see this and to see such an iconic image and then see all the uh, correction it makes you feel makes you feel good. Um, you know, I, it's like this master, and then you're like, oh, he's human. <laughs> exactly. I'm guessing he's using a pen. Nib, not much uh, smaller or larger, about the same size as this crow quill, this 102, uh, to ink it. Hello, Tom Hoffelder. Hey, Tom. So there you go. There's a, a piece from Stuart Little. Anthropomorphic animals was something uh, that uh, Garth could do very, very well. But there are some other masters of anthropomorphic animals, and one of them I'd like to share with you. Teeing it up. Little intro. Another going from something very big. <laughs> oh, yes. A true master among masters. This thing's not going to stay up here, is it? Stay. Here, hold on. 
I can like balance my. All right, it's going here. Um, oh, I'm super excited. You know, we get, need to get you a little shelf there at the bottom. I know. All right, we're, we're closing in on the end of our, pre our presentation slash hangout slash art out, Ange, but I've saved some of the best for last. This is, uh, of course, the unbelievable Beatrix Potter. Uh, everyone knows her. Uh, a brilliant and amazing talent and, um, and a brilliant mind. She was obviously super influential on loads of artists. Maury Sendak was obsessed with her. Uh, he had her cane. I think he had her cane yes. and her. And he had modeled when we when we went to visit his house. He had a gate that modeled uh, Beatrix's garden, garden gate. gate. Um, I found these early editions at a flea market at the Brimfield uh, Antique Fair. There was an, a furniture dealer who had a little stack of them, and we got them for next to nothing. They're beat and loved, but I love them to death because it really shows other early editions. But it shows how they were made. So if we look closely, we have two different types of paper that this book is printed on. This was definitely indicative of production of books uh, at, the, at the turn of the 18th into, or the 19th into the 20th century. You have kind of a soft, coarse uh, paper here that the, that the type is printed on here. It's, it's absorbent, it holds the ink very well. It would have been just black ink. And then we have almost a, a shiny, almost like a heavy magazine paper. It probably has a, a what we call a sizing, which I've mentioned uh, on the feed before, Ange, which is um, a coat on top of the paper to make it smooth. A lot of times this was clay. And uh, this was, would allow for this unbelievable uh, reproduction uh, of these delicate watercolors. But if you look, you get a, you get a page of, of black and white and then the, the fancy paper, they can't print on both sides. So they're, they're kind of in between signatures. So you get a, a, you can really see it here. You get the sheet on this. Now this is more yellow than this because this paper has more acid in it. So it's aging. The acid's breaking the paper down faster than this. This has less acid in it. So it's, it's not as acidic, but watch, you can see no art on this side. And you can see the stitching. So you can tell that this, the way they printed this is you would have had just simply one sheet with two images on one side. Does that make sense? And then they're just folding it in half mm -hmm. to yeah, give you the color. Gonna, and then these are just like stitched spread, stitched into the book, right? They didn't have the ability to print on both sides or it was too expensive, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not a, 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 as educated on the process as how they did it. A lot of fans of Beatrix Potter. A lot of fans, I love Beatrix's work. Um, what I love, now we you don't think of her necessarily for pen and ink, but there's pen and ink in these. Um, obviously, they're observed from nature. There's no question about that. We're going to look at a couple of these. So you can see I've got some bookmarks here. Um, a lot of these um, uh, for this book were archived at, I believe, the British Museum. And so I was able to find some beautiful high-resolution scans, uh, not just from this book, um, but some other neat stuff. Uh, we'll start here with to show a little bit of process. Um, before we dig in, I did find... Uh, from uh, 1899, Beatrix was 33 years old. I don't think she was published yet, but we've got a, a set of drawings here that Beatrix did. No question, these are from life. No question. My hunch here, Ange, is these rabbits. Now, we, if you don't know, Beatrix grew up on a farm, lived on a farm her entire life. Um, my hunch is, and she collected and loved, I mean, there's, I've read books on her where she, you know, if she saw a dead bird, she, she'd bring it home in a shoebox and draw it. You know, because she's like, okay, it's finally sitting still. She was life drawing. She was life drawing from real animals. So this rabbit could be sleeping or maybe it's forever Permanent sleeping. Yes. Forever sleep. um, so these rabbits would have all been sketched from life. And then she's um, taking those sketches and turning them into these very simple ink drawings. My guess is this was definitely intended to be colorized at some point. And then the rabbit, it looks like it's a rabbit dreaming. And he's dreaming of being in a, a bed, <laughs> which is just amazing. So you, it, what I love about this ink sample is it really shows um, her boiling and distilling down her understanding of anatomy into just simple contour line. Let's get onto the book and see how she was able to apply this some years later in The Tale of the Flopsy Bunnies, Ange. 
I was able to find, um, uh, it looked like maybe a preparatory for this piece. So here we have, here we have the book and I'll zoom in. I was obsessed with Beatrix Potter when I was a kid. I, I remember specifically in sixth grade when we had to start reading books that had a lot more text mm -hmm. than pictures. Mm -hmm. I, I became really frustrated um, because I was a reluctant reader and had difficulty with reading comprehension. So I actually snuck Beatrix Potter books out of the library in my backpack. I swiped them from the library because I loved them so much. Loved them. And somebody said that they were, they're like a hug. And they really Oh, are. they are. They are like a hug. Um... So here's uh, this original uh, illustration. This is to give you a sense of the size Beatrix worked, very small. Um, so not much larger than the final, uh, but there's ink work in here. If we get up on top of it, you can really see the line. So I was, I was wondering, Ange, did she ink first or ink later? We have answers. We have answers. I have answers for you. She inked first. This was also from the book. I, I love a lot of things about this. Number one, that giant X. Beatrix was like, nope, not this one. Didn't, wasn't working for her. I love seeing that. Makes her human. Makes her fallible. Um, and it shows exactly, this would have been, if she had not put an X on it and decided she wanted to finish it, I suspect she would have moved on to the next stage from here. So, But this is the amount of inking she would have done. I see a little bit of pencil preliminary work, but it looks like she's erased most of it. So she would have sketched this. No doubt she would have collected a series of life drawing sketches of rabbits and probably a nook in her farm that she would have drawn. This is this is probably some area in her barn. She would have set all this up and kind of drawn it. I think what's really interesting about this is it really speaks to kind of the spectrum of anthropomorphizing animals. Yes. Because her animals look very realistic. Real. Yes. But they just happen to be wearing clothes. <laughs> No pants, mm -hmm. but maybe an occasional jacket or two. Right? I mean, they still, like, the anatomy still looks like that of so an animal. She, she when you understands look at it. Like Garth, who we were just looking at, that looks much more human. Yes. With Stuart Little. Absolutely. I believe Garth was an editorial illustrator as well, Ange, before he, he started with books. I want to say he was doing stuff for possibly The New Yorker. I could be wrong on that. I'm a little hazy. Um, so Beatrix, this would have been preliminary. I think what she did, Ange, is she would have taken either ink, uh, probably ink. You can't see it as much here, but in some of the other samples, she would have done a little light wash for her shadow. So she would have inked it first, clearly inked in a sepia. This is not black. It, oops, sorry. We got a little excited there. This is definitely done in, in a sepia ink. She did not use uh, black ink. So it would have further added that kind of softness to it. Um, so she would have diluted that sepia ink and would have done um, tonals, all her shadows, all the tone, and then laid the color on top of it, if that makes sense. Um, we have a pretty neat uh, example, again, of process. Love the color palette. Oh, yeah. Later in the book, where Benjamin and Flopsy thought it was time to go home. And it's almost time for us to go home, but we've still got a few more surprises for you. We have the... Um, the original for this that we can look at and give you a sense of it. So it's it's pretty close. The reproduction is mind-blowing. Um, you may say, hey, wow, this is a little brighter. Well, the other thing you have to bear in mind, when Beatrix was alive, all of this would have been, you know, white. This, this paper would have been this color. This paper she's painting on, it also would have been this color. So maybe what we'll do in the future, Ange, is we'll do one where we show it what it looks like now, and then we'll color correct it to show what it looked like when she was actually working on it. That's that's what that's the next level, Ange. Well, and I think you know, with original or especially working with inks, you have to be very concerned about exposure to light. Yes. Too. Yes. Um, I mean, you're here. We're talking about reproduction, but even now, if you see some of these pieces in. Um, museums or galleries like we've seen, you mm -hmm. know, you will, the artwork now looks much lighter because it's faded so much or from exposure to light. We get an amazing bonus, which is why I chose this illustration. We have a, 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 an abandoned early version of it, which also gives a clue to how she worked. What's unbelievable to me, Ange, when, we, when I look at this is that she's painted most of the background in, but not the figures. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a study or if this was an attempt at finish. It looks pretty finished to me. Like, I think she was going for a finish on it. There's a lot more ink work 
that she abandons. Is she doing that from life? It just looks like almost like somebody's sketchbook where they're just, you know, looking at something and drawing it and have their little, you know, inks with them or their watercolors. She with could them. have done it from life. I, I'm not a scholar on Beatrix. I mean, I have a book on her that I, I read years ago about her life and stuff. Um, um, my hunch is. She's drawing all. She's doing watercolor studies and sketches from life. So she's like, okay, I've done my my morning chores on the farm. I'm going to sit uh, this afternoon or this early this morning. I'm going to sketch my garden, right. and then she's adding the rabbits. And here I thought the bird, which wasn't in the initial. Um, my guess is if you walked around on her property, you can probably find this exact vista somewhere on right. her property. Yeah, and then she's she's. There's like little fantasies playing out with the bunnies and the foxes and the birds and the ducks and the hedgehogs that were just probably part of her everyday that's what life thinking, being on the farm. I think that's why it just feels, I and mean, you're so there because you feel like she's just sitting there drawing and painting and then, okay, I'm going to put all my characters in. Yeah. Uh, it Yeah, so it's interesting to me that she didn't really quite figure out exactly... The rabbits. My hunch is she abandoned it on the baby here. This is probably, it looks like she penciled everything in. She starts to ink the baby and, and then says, nope, I'm out. Um, when I compare that to the final, golly, something's, it's the feet. She didn't like the feet and the head. It's, it's the mother's face. Let me see if I can do this here. We can get them both close enough to each other. I believe, Ange, it's the... She wants that mother's face interlocking with the with the child here, and it's not, it's not doing it on this side. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. It's almost like the little bunny's giving the mom a kiss on the cheek, and it's not happening here. And I think she must... I'm, I'm theorizing, folks. I have no idea, but... It's clear to me that she abandoned it once she started the rabbits. So for some reason she was unhappy with it. Now it could have been an overall thing. It could have been just like oh, I've over inked the flowers, um, but now yeah, they're about the same. They're a little less inked. You know, sometimes you're just off. Sometimes it just doesn't feel right. You yeah, know, and you just and you just let it go. That. I've Too, done it. You're just like Ugh, I'm just tight. It's just not flowing. This is what's mind blowing to me. This where it's just. She is inking knowing she's going to color it. So that's why you're not getting hard lines. You're getting dots. You're almost getting uh, just quick guidelines of what she's going to resolve in watercolor. I mean, it's just dots for the leaves here. It's really neat to see it up close and see how she did it. So that's it. The, the, the key to Beatrix being so amazing at doing this was because she spent years doing this observe from life. It's just unbelievable. Linda Granger said when you're talking it sounds like you're a detective cracking the case. That's it, it does because That's it's it. like it's like artistic forensics. Absolutely. And I wanted to know there's certain things I'm like if I was watching this what would I want to know? This book came out in 1909. She was 43 years old. She had done a load of books at this point. So this was you know, another day at the office for her. She she was she was definitely in her stride. One of the things I want to mention that's it's not really part of this feed, but it's one of the things that I think makes Beatrix so um, groundbreaking in her time, Ange, is she's one of the first, if not the first, children's book creator to license her characters. During her lifetime, Peter Rabbit was was licensed onto, you know, sheets and curtains and teacups and stuff. That had not happened uh, to my knowledge before. I remember reading that in the book. Now we see it, you know, Eric Carle has made an entire, he was able to build a museum based on putting the hungry caterpillar on all kinds of of um, merchandise. merchandise, but um, Beatrix Potter was definitely one of the first to do it. So incredibly innovative and, and a brilliant mind as well. Love these books, love this art. I've, I've been fortunate enough to see a oh, few of these. Right. Somebody mentioned that cabbage. Is it a cabbage on the right? Yes. Um, and how, look how much space. Yeah, big, nice catch. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's almost like maybe she did it on another day. Like she's like, yeah, let's go. You know what? This one's not happening. Let's we'll come back to it tomorrow. All right, we got a couple more. Hang in there. Oh, here I'll leave these up while I grab. 
I love artistic forensics. I think it's so cool. I think the beginning of it was those highlights magazines when I would, I personally was that, I would obsess over that. I would shoot my eyes back and forth, darting back and forth to try and find all the details of the changes. I, I love that. Angel, save some of the best for last. I know. I know who you're, your numero uno. Yeah, of course. But we've oh, we've made yeah, us huh? we've made a stew to get there, Ange. We've made a soup of master illustrators, well, and now Sylvester. we're getting to near the end of our today's. Uh... Will you be able to stitch these two together when you put them on YouTube? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, when I put them on YouTube, I can QuickTime will let me put them back together. Here it is. One of the the mo one of the most impressionable images on me and probably millions of other children and other artists as well. Uh, Ernest Shepard's drawing from the opening scene of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, this is one of my first introductions to art. Is this my mom reading this to me when I can't read yet, laying in bed looking at the illustrations? I'm not even going to bother with the book for this one. We all know this illustration all too well. Uh, it came out in 1926. Um, Ernest Shepard was 47 years old when he illustrated it. It sold recently at auction for 139,000 pounds. So I'm going to guess that's $200,000 or maybe, or maybe more, depending on our wacky, uh, our wacky uh, trade, uh, our money with, uh, with the pound. It's such a simple and beautifully observed illustration um, Shepard, like John Tenniel, was an editorial illustrator for Punch magazine. Um, he had been doing it for, for many, many years prior to illustrating for Winnie the Pooh. $190,000. Today. So 200, it sold yeah, for 200. This sheet of paper sold for $200,000. <laughs> and, and, and that wasn't recent. That was a few years back. Um, this, the, the funny thing, when I look at Winnie the Pooh, and we're going to compare it to some other Shepard art here in a minute. The Pooh art is, uh, there's an innocence. This, that's it, man. Like to be able to capture a, a child's face as beautifully, there's an innocence that's observed from life. There's no question. Shepard excelled at illustrating uh, children. He just was a master of it. And it's all through observation. I can tell you because that hand and that hand, not so great, but it doesn't, you don't care. You're not really looking at the anatomy because the overall sentiment is so powerful. Um, he doesn't bother with heavy hatching in the background. It's all about this bear. Here's what I love about this too. The is darkest one... dark and right. the lightest light are on that bear. Go ahead, Ange. No, you know when you see an old photo yes. of a child... Yes. And they don't know they're being photographed. Yes. That's what it feels like to me. It's yeah. just so pure. It just seems so... Magic. Yeah. It's like a... Fo it is. You look like you're looking at an old photo. And in some ways you are. Christopher Milne, son of Christopher Robin, was the basis for it. So he was inspired by the actual child. So that's Christopher Milne's page boy haircut that he would have had in the 1920s. The the animals, Pooh, uh, Tigger, Piglet, etc., were inspired by actual stuffed animals that Christopher Milne had. Um, although there's some debate that the Pooh Bear was based on a bear, a stuffed bear that Ernest Shepherd had, um, because if you look at the original Christopher Milne Pooh Bear, it looks very different than this. Um, but all the other animals are are very close, and you can Google it and and see them in in uh, online. Um, again, just very simple. It's, it's, there's an openness, an airiness to this that you don't see actually in a lot of Shepard's other art. There's spots um, that I had for, for Pooh. Most of them is, if you remember the books, they're just kind of the characters standing around kind of doing things. And I'm going to say he spent a whopping, you know, half an hour, you know, sketching it and inking it. It was like done. And there's numerous of uh, these. This is a much more uh, involved illustration. We really wanted to show the mastery of his craft here, but it's, it really pales in comparison to some of the pen and ink work that he did for Punch magazine, um, but it's such an iconic piece; it doesn't matter. It's I've got so a, pure. I've got it's a just so pure. It's it's just that the innocence, the connection, 
We have anybody with children and you have a child who is dragged around their favorite stuffed animal. I mean, just the perfect snapshot into childhood. Keep talking, Itch. Okay, I'll keep talking. Keep talking. I got, I, I'm looking for, I got the poop I just here. love it. I love the little, little knees. And you're right, the hands, it's not like you look at that and go, wow, that's an amazingly drawn hand, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to be. How are you guys holding up? Oh, here it is. Sorry. Are you guys going to want some pen and ink uh, homework? I think that will be fun. We'll have to come up with an assignment, a pen and ink assignment. So that way, on the Drawn to Fantasy fan page, then you guys can share all of your uh, work that you're creating. And hopefully, you guys are feeling inspired by all of this. All right. Got one more from Winnie the Pooh. Um... The truth was there was so much Winnie the Pooh out there. I didn't know where to stop and where to end. So I just wanted to pick a couple really good examples. And I also wanted to not I, – I don't know this for a fact, Angie. I'm surmising what I'm about to say. But I suspect that, um, you know, for, for Shepard as it was maybe for some of these other artists like John Tenniel, their fame tied to one particular phenomenon level thing may have been a love-hate thing for him. I mean Shepard illustrated for Punch for years – um, if you look on the internet, I mean, he had to draw and redraw Winnie the Pooh for the rest of his life. And I don't know if that was something he was excited about or not as excited about. Someone who's a scholar of Shepard might know, but I, I, I suspect that someone who has a full lifetime of illustrating and then is drawing a stuffed bear for the rest of her life, there, there may be mixed feelings on that. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but um, I wanted to show an illustration. As I said, yeah, a lot of the illustrations in the book are this. They're these just simple little sketchy things. So I wanted to show something that's a little denser. Um, this is the illustration at actual size of a rabbit coming in to cause trouble, as always, with uh, here he's visiting Owl. And it's just amazing to see how much is lost. This is, a, again, an, an early printing, but by no means a first edition. So that you can get a sense. But this is what I would have grown up with, these kind of crumbly lines, very sketchy. It's, you're getting a lot of the, the cross hatching here, but when we look at the original and we can actually see some of the weight in the line, especially on, on Owl's back here. Was this dip pen? This all dip pen, okay. yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, it might have been black ink originally. I'm guessing this, clearly this thing has been, <laughs> you can see where the mat was. You can see where the sunlight has just blasted this piece of art so this for is years. So this is scan of the original this that probably scan. would have been in somebody's collection. Yep, and it um, was in a mat. So it was matted. It was clearly matted, and we can see where the mat... Now, the mat may have had acid in it, and that could be acid burned from the mat, or it could be the original paper, but I'm going to guess this was hit, being hit by sunlight, and this is all light damage done to it. Um, regardless, the ink work still remains because it was India ink and it can withstand that kind of, uh, sunblast. The, the photograph or the scan of it could also be a little contrasty. Mm -hmm. Um, but it allows us to see so much of what's going on and how, how it all, uh, translates. Uh, it's interesting here, rabbit. Uh, rabbit and um, owl were not stuffed animals. They were supposed to be real animals that lived in the 100-acre wood. So it's kind of neat to see some of the details. But it's cool to see, like, you get to see, like, his hat rack. And you can see the other additional knobs, which are just gone in this sketch. You don't really see them. So it's just little details that kind of support the illustration. But the overall idea of owl being kind of sleepy definitely comes through. They're very loose. Um, there's a little bit of study. Uh, there's a lot of study, I'm sorry, but there's the execution seems very quick to me. It's part of his style, but I also think it's, um, there's an airiness that maybe he felt the, the, the work needed, especially in this opening shot of Christopher Robin. It feels very open and airy, like, because he wanted it to feel light, and not heavy. Just, it, it adds to the comfort and the charm. Yes. Um, and I think... That speaks to wanting it to feel familiar, right? Like your 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 best stuffed animal friend. You yes. Just want it to feel that cozy. Uh, Winnie the Pooh wasn't the only famous bit of literature that Ernest Shepherd illustrated. Later, a little later in his life, he illustrated *The Wind in the Willows*. He was not the original illustrator for *Wind in the Willows*. Um, 
by Kenneth Graham, but he certainly did illustrate some other early Kenneth Graham stuff. This is the version of The Wind in the Wells that I grew up uh, reading. I, that was the Ernest Shepard one. I love that. It. There's nine billion drawings in here as well. Uh, we've got a couple examples. So here's Ratty and Mole. Uh, Mole's probably whinging and complaining as always. And here's the original. So we can get in there and kind of... So spontaneous. They do. It feels like he's there and he's drawing it from life. Yeah. Similar to Beatrix Potter. So what I'm thinking is this table and chair, this is probably from his, this cupboard. This is all probably like part of his reality. It's probably a friend's house or his house. And he's, uh, he's drawing it, and then he's just simply adding in the characters. There's a bit of whiteout going on here. I don't know if you guys can see it. There's some around uh, Raddy's mouth. There's a little bit on Mole's head. might be hard to see in this printout, but I could certainly see it in the, um, in the scan when I was preparing it. Um, I have a question. Yeah? He, obviously a huge influence on you. What yes. What of your books do you think influenced, uh, he influenced most? Spiderwick. Absolutely. This is Spiderwick all the way, guys. I mean, as much as I want to say it's Arthur Rackham, it's Ernest Shepard. The sketchiness. But it also reminds me of the Heinrich Kley stuff that just, that taking the pen and just kind of, I'm going to draw you a little picture, a little scene, and here's what it's going to look like. And him just kind of sitting there with the pen and just sketching it out for you, you know? It looks like he's using two different nibs here, and or he's really giving the, uh, the Hunts 102 a workout. Uh, that's a thick line. Um, I, it's all pen. I don't think he's using brush. Um, and he's really just going in. I'm guessing, yeah, maybe two pens to get his heavy, heavy shadows. Can you do me a favor? Where's that? Do you saw that Garth piece where he did Stuart? Because yeah. I feel like... Let's compare some stuff. Let's compare because yeah, it's actually a very similar pose. Um, and obviously a very similar character. So it Little? is interesting, yeah, to that Stuart Little piece. Because yeah, it's interesting to see how two artists working in the same medium. Let's zoom out. There we go. So here you go, that Garth. Piece, that's so interesting. interesting. Well, here you have, so let's see, Shepard is... He's 52 years. He's a year older than me when he does this in 1931. This is the difference of... He's 33 years old. Yep. This is the difference of 20 years and hundreds of illustrations. This is a tighter, less secure line. He's insecure, which is why you're seeing loads of whiteout and a very, very tight hatch. This is a person who can do this with their eyes closed. You know, he's been doing it for decades, most of his life. Right? And, uh, and that's why you're it's seeing like it. It's like the difference between you doing Planescape. Oh, yeah. The difference between you doing Spiderwick. No. Yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, because if we look at later Garth Williams, it's much looser as well. They both become more con He becomes more confident in his line work. You get psyched out. You know, you want to, especially if it's something that's meaningful. When Garth worked on Stuart Little's, the first, it was E.B. White's first kid's book. There was a lot of excitement around it. E.B. White was pretty known at that point. Um, so he had a lot of pressure. Like, could have reference. Could have been. Could your just, reference lies to you a bit. Could have been some just overall pressure. He could have just been freaked out. Like, I got to make this work. And that causes you to choke up, to tighten up. And these are really dense, tight, yeah. tight hatching that's gone even when you look at Charlotte's Web. Right. When, I was going to say, when you look at that cover of Charlotte's Web... And this just comes from practicing. You know, it's, for me, it's like cooking. You know, the more you do it, the more confident you get. Look at that. So from 19, yeah, so there's your difference. 1945. Hold on, I've got to put my things back on. So in seven years, Ange, seven years, that's the difference between Stuart Little and... Uh, and you can really see the difference. Right? You, you can, can really see, see the difference. And you see here he's getting, uh, I don't know if Ernest Shepard was an inspiration to Garth. I'm going to assume it was. It seems obviously yeah. to me it was. I think Shepard was an inspiration to so many pen and ink artists of the 20th century. Um, just unbelievable. And he was a year older than me when he did this. It was just amazing. I got one other from from uh, Wind in the Willows too because I just love, it's very Pooh-like. And, it, you know, Pooh gets a lot of love, so it was cool to kind of show some other uh, images, but this is also very poo-like. I love that Toad sometimes almost looks like Same he has hair. Yeah. 
I'm guessing it's... It's his, probably his it's, table. It's his chair. Right. Yeah, it's the same chair. It's his house. It's probably... Right? Or they're at Raddy's house. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Or he's did, got his china cabinet in the back. Or they're at Toes. I don't remember. I'm having total deja vu right now. I've actually had it a couple times. Whoa. While we've been doing this. Well, because I do it a lot and I love it. Yeah, but specific moments. Really nice. interesting. Nice. All right, I feel Ange. like when I get deja vu, I'm like, it's kind of like my subconscious just saying, you're on the right path. Oh, well, that's good to hear. All right, Ange, my favorite. I know we we have run way over today. Is it too far? We were going to... I mean, we really could have an episode strictly dedicated to your, your final artist. We could. But... Oh. And there were many I missed. There were a lot of artists that oh we gosh. could have... I, Rose O'Neill... Uh, w. Heath Robinson, um, and this was just people from the past. I think it'd be really cool to do one with all contemporary. What if we did one with contemporary artists, but also had them as a guest? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So Barbara McClintock, yes. the Pete DeSeds, so the cool. all that. So here it is. About that. So Would we you got. Guys like to have other artists uh, come on here? Let us know. Arthur Rackham. There's no one thing about Arthur Rackham's art that speaks, uh, I'll try to zoom out, there it is. There's no one thing, Ange, it's a lot of things. When I see a, a piece of art like this, I hear classical music. It's, it's like a master at, uh, at his craft. These are uh, Rackham pieces that have been at auction. His work actually comes up on auction quite a bit. And um, so I was, there's a lot of terrific large scans out there that I can scan to sh you know, that that you can look up and see and study his artwork. Um, these are in color. I do have some samples, uh, black and white. I do have a bl couple black and white samples here. We're going to look at in a second. But I just wanted you to get that overall oh of Rackham. Uh, Rackham. If you don't know, Arthur Rackham was a British illustrator who was active, really from 1900 to about 1939. Yes, Emily, I agree. Diverse artists, for sure. Yes, yes. We, we mentioned that earlier on, that the, unfortunately that none of these are very diverse. Um, uh, amazing talent in, in a short time. Affected, I think of Rackham a lot because he was affected by war, you know, World War I. Uh, certainly had a huge impact on his career. These books that he made were lavish. They were expensive. Rackham was doing Kickstarter before there was Kickstarter, Ange. So what he would do is he would do the illustrations for a book. They would, he was teamed up with a gallery, and the gallery would do a, like an opening event for the book. And there at the gallery, you could buy two versions of the book. You buy a fancy signed limited edition version of the book that was wrapped in fancy vellum, or you could buy the trade edition of the book. You could buy an a gift version. Yep, and then a lot, of, and a lot of times, and then even on top of that, he would do one where he would sketch and draw on it, and those would be numbered as well. So you maybe ten of them had a drawing in it. Then you could buy the original artwork as well, and he did this for every book that he did. Brilliant, so brilliant how he did it. I have a couple signed books of his. I don't have any of the really big, fancy pants ones. They generally sell for about a thousand dollars. I do have a pretty decent uh, trade. This is Arthur Rackham's book of pictures. I think this is signed. I could be wrong. Let's see. We'll, we'll find out together. Maybe not. Probably not. No. But also tipped in. So we looked at Beatrix Potter and how her stuff uh, was placed in the book. These would have been printed on that same kind of paper and glued down. Someone would have hand glued the printed illustration into the book. Most of these illustrations are pretty close to the final size, a little bit redu slightly reduced, but not by much. In other versions, you have a tissue overlay that has the caption. This was called a gift book. This was it. This was this came out in 1913. This one I have loads of Rackham upstairs. Um, these gift books uh, were the rage uh, until the sh uh, paper shortage from World War One affected it. Uh, this one is one of my favorites because it's kind of some of Rackham's just favorite art. It's kind of just a, almost a, an art of book. He's kind of taken some of his favorite illustrations and put it all into, into one book. And there's some epic, amazing pieces. Um, there's a couple interesting things, though. So we see in these printings, if I really get on them, they're good. They're very detailed. And certainly for 
1913, they would have been mind-blowing to see, but they're grainy and they're contrasty. Um, Rackham knew what his art would do when it was reproduced. In other words, he knew it would get a little contrasty and break apart, and he compensated for that when he did his work. If we compare that to um, really getting in on one of his illustrations, you can see that beautiful pen work and um, his soft use of color. It's really, it's really just a pen drawing with, with tint applied to it. We've got a couple examples of, of it. Um, this one here, near, this is the last book he illustrated, Ange. This is The Wind in the Willows. He did this, and, and um, he did it in 1938. He was 71 years old when he did this one, and he died the following year. The book was actually released posthumously after he passed away. Um, but it really gives you a sense of a true master. There's a lot of loose sketchiness. It's essentially a, a pen drawing with a little bit of, of color. Everything here is referenced. Um, Rackham, you and I very early on went to New York City and we went to Columbia University, which has a huge holding of Rackham that's not really available to the public. There's a long-winded story here. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but we did get to page through some of his sketchbooks. And he had a sketchbook kind of tied to every book that he did, a, a, full of preparatory drawings. And he would have had a model come in and would have drawn her from life. This is all drawn from life. And then he would take those drawing, those sketches and use those for reference for his final illustrations. We thought we were pretty cool. We were like, we were taking this trip to New York City and we were like, let's call and see if we can get in and see all the Rackham originals at Columbia. So I called up and I was like, yes, I represent <laughs> illustrator Tony D. Chalisi and he would like to come in to view the author Rackham originals. Because <laughs> I thought, well, that's what you should do. They're like, who? And uh, they said, okay, come on in. Yeah, you did it. You were able to do it. Set up an appointment, and we were able to do it. Got some prices on these. This one was this was English Fairy Tales in 1918. This one sold for eighteen thousand dollars. Give you an idea. Of this little drawing. My favorite um, in art. Uh, Norman Rockwell's Adventures in Illustration. Rockwell travels abroad to England and visits with Rackham, and and kind of poo poos Rackham's art because he's like they're just drawings. You know, Rockwell's paintings are as big as my drafting table, and he's a painter. And these are pen drawings. Here's some examples of some pen and ink work here. This is um, from also from English fairy tales. He was my age when he did this one, Ange. Beautifully observed. Look at those hands. Arthritic. The toes. He's using a couple of nibs. Or he's using one and he just knows what he's doing. I suspect he's using a big, big nib like this. That's got a lot of, there's a lot of play in this nib. It can do a lot of things, which I'll show you here in a minute. I'd say where Shepard was the inspiration on Spiderwick, Rackham actually is huge inspiration on Planescape. Planescape, yeah. And and just his overall spirit. This was a, a, to show you what the black and white work would look like. This was a magazine illustration he did early in his career, 1902. This was Ghosts in Their Ways from Castle's Magazine. So it gives you... When all of this post-COVID craziness is through, I think we should all have a drawn to fantasy field trip. Oh, that'd be fun. Right? And we could go to a museum together and we could meet up. That'd be cool. That'd be so cool. Be very cool. Um, yes, Joanne Lone mentioned that. I think I could. I think we should totally do that. We're good. Let's plan on it so we all have something to look forward to. That'd be amazing. Might not be until 2022, but, you know, we can do it. We can do it. Um, I was going to end with a little demo of how Rackham worked, but I got to tell you guys, we've been going for so long. We've been going for, for two hours. Maybe we'll save that for the next time. Um, but here it is. I mean, it, just some of the ink illustration, I thought it would, would open your eyes a little bit to see how different artists uh, worked. These are artists that had such an unbelievable impact and influence on me as a young artist. There are many, many more. Uh, I just picked a handful to kind of do a deeper dive with, spend a little time with each day. I think everybody I mentioned today has a book on them. I can post a list later of what books to buy. Uh, there's some pretty complete ones. There's Art Ofs of Maurice Sendak and, and, 
and uh, Rackham and, and uh, so on and so forth. I think the only one, sadly, who doesn't have an art of book is Garth Williams, Ange, which is a real shame. Wow. Um, even John Tenniel, there's some great, uh, Harvard has a lot of John Tenniel originals. They've got a little sketchbook of John's sketches. Uh, there's an art of Ernest Shepard, um, and so on and so forth. But that's, that's the show today. That's it. Well, you've got, you're shouting out to so many artists and it's from the response. Everybody has really, really, really enjoyed this past two hours. Awesome. Um, I want to take a moment to shout out to a couple people, um, Tom Hoffelder, and his wife, I know, uh, recently recovered from COVID. I know you guys were not feeling well. Um, Bunny Lynn Norton, her stepdaughter is currently, um, has COVID Oof. on a ventilator. So thank you, Bunny Lynn, for being with us today. Wow, thank you. Offer you a distraction. Um, and you know, this, this is the beauty of art. This is, art connects all of us. That's right. Um, so even though we can't physically be together, we're all together looking at all of these amazing, legendary greats of illustration and pen and ink. So. It's been a real pleasure offering this distraction for you all today and, and talking about some of these artists that mean so much to me. And um, I had a real, I, Ange can tell you, for the last two weeks, I've been scanning and downloading and printing and getting all this ready f to share with you guys. I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have talking about it. And, uh, you know, let's do a junk pot, Ange. I got, uh, for all these prints, there's, there's a dozen of them that I printed at the wrong size and the wrong scale, but we've got loads of them we can shove in an envelope and send to somebody. Who do you think, uh, who do you think we, we should send uh, the junk pot to today? <laughs> All right. Oh gosh. Um, oh my goodness. It's so hard to choose, but I think I, I you have... You ready? Drum roll. What if I have two winners? Can I have two? Yeah, I think I've got enough prints to okay, send to two people. Yeah, you ready? Two. Here we go. Here's the drum roll. Our first is going to be... Bunny Lynn Norton. That's it, Bunny Lynn, Lynn Norton. A little something to brighten your day. We're going to send you these high quality prints. Reproductions. Paper tape. I don't know. They're on. They're on paper. You'll be able to look at them and say, you know, Tony Dietrichlisi sent this to me, and they're going and your friends will go who, but they'll go. I know that's Stuart Little. Um, so we'll send we'll send you some some printouts. And uh, you said you had one more. I have one other. All right, go another, for it. Okay. Who else is getting it? Ready? Who Part else two. Is getting it. Tried and true fan. Shipman. Jill Suzanne Shipman. That's a name I see you very talk often. About a lot of men today, so I picked a couple of ladies. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> well, listen, none of these men had the foresight that Beatrix Potter did to license these characters <laughs> into. It would take Walt Disney to do it for for Winnie the Pooh. Certainly not Ern, Ernest Shepard and A. A. Milne. You guys have been terrific. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been my pleasure to offer this diversion and talk art. Uh, Holly Black said she loves talking about other people's books more than her own. I think I agree. This was a real real treat for me. Uh, sorry for the, the pause in the middle, but we'll, uh, we'll splice them together and make it one long marathon uh, episode. Thank you guys so much. I hope you're safe. I hope you're well, and we'll see you soon. Stay healthy, guys. Mask up. Thanks for joining us on. Oh, I forgot to put the music on, T. Put it on. I was just distracted. I put on you because you said this is like you hear classical music. So <laughs> on, uh, I had classical music on there. So if you could hear that in the background, there it is. For our song, Drawn to Fantasy. We did it. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. And a great distraction for us, too. Did you have fun doing all this research, T? I did. Kind of getting, it's like getting reacquainted with old friends. <laughs> Just FYI, Ange, I have about 400 Winnie the Pooh drawings I'm going to be printing out over the next... <laughs> We're gonna, we could wrap gifts in them. <laughs> we could wallpaper with them. That's it. We got to art out. We can use them as placemats. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, it was awesome. It was really good. Some really amazing people who helped out, too, to get these files. Thank you, guys. And also, um, oh, homework. We got homework for we you We got guys. homework on top of it? Holy cow. What do you get got? Get out your pens. Get out your inks, whether they are micron, dip pen, thick pen, whatever you want to use. Show me what you got. Show me what you got. 
How about a drawing in pen and ink inspired by your favorite story from childhood? Ooh, I like that. That sounds awesome. I'm in. On drawn to fantasy. Fantasy. Off key. <laughs> That's what I do. Oh man. Thank you. Come back and see You're it. just in time for the end credits. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.